that's a new thing that zoom does they it talks to us um it's sort of strange uh yeah welcome everybody to always coming home uh the book club for mutations um like i mentioned this, the reading wasn't necessary to start with today. Uh, this is just sort of an introduction discussion. Um, we can perhaps talk a little bit about Le Guin talking about the book, uh, maybe some highlights. And then we're going to be going into basically breaking into three sections. Um, generally speaking, the book is it doesn't need to be read in a linear way. But there is a story in here. And as Le Guin writes, you know, she has sections of the book that are part of the story and then it kind of breaks up into poems and other stories and um <clears throat> sort of collections from the cash um and then it, then the story continues later on in the book and then there's a kind of an end area of just lots of interesting anthropological notes about this may have been in the future uh space in northern california um but yeah like like i'm saying Let's let's get the first part done in terms of like between now and the next section that we read or uh, next time we convene, read the first part, then for the second one, we'll read the second part and the third one, third part, and whatever else we want to do. Um, so I think that's a good rhythm. How does everybody feel about that in terms of um, reading assignments? Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, so where to begin? My gosh, there's so much to say about this book. And it's sort of uh, this, for those of us who are not doing the, the Gepser course, nevertheless, it's this kind of um, companion book to Ever-Present Origin, just in its title alone, always coming home, an Ever-Present Origin. Um, as we've already mentioned in a lot of discussions online and, and on the internet, um, Le Guin is a Taoist thinker, um, writer, or was. Uh, and, and Gebser is very much, you know, though he didn't describe himself that way, uh, the way he talks about things is very much in step with the way Le Guin does, just in terms of integral consciousness and aperspectivity. Very close ties with Taoism, as, as some of my Chinese medicine friends talk about. So there's these aperspectival themes that are linking these texts together, and it's just a beautiful beautiful not novel in terms of her writing. Um, so it's a rich text. There's a lot here and there's a lot to explore. Um, there's a few opening parts just in terms of um, the way Le Guin is talking about writing that I thought maybe we could also discuss together today. Like um, her in the, in the first note, she talks about um, a difficulty of translation from a language that doesn't yet exist is considerable, but there's no need to exaggerate it. The past, after all, can be quite as obscure as the future. The ancient Chinese book called the Tao Te Ching has been translated into English dozens of times, and indeed the Chinese have, have to keep retranslating it into Chinese at every cycle of Cathay. Does anybody know what that is? I didn't actually look that up. Um, and then she continues, but no translation can give us the book that Lao Tzu, who may not have existed, wrote. All we have is the Tao Te Ching that is here now. And so with translations from a literature of the or a future, the fact that it does that it hasn't yet been written, the mere absence of a text to translate doesn't make all that much difference. What was and what may be lie like children whose faces we cannot see in the arms of silence. All we ever have is here now. Um, just beautiful opening there that got me hooked and then her uh, it's like one page or so towards an archaeology of the future where that's sort of reiterated um just talking about the sort of envy of, of the archaeologists who are able to hold these objects in their hands and unlike them Le Guin um has to find other methods um and towards the end of this she says the only way i can think to find them these people of the future the only archaeology that might be practical is as follows you take your child or grandchild in your arms, a young baby, not a year old yet, and go down into the wild oats in the field below the barn. Stand under the oak on the last slope of the hill, facing the creek. Stand quietly. Perhaps the baby will see something, or hear a voice, or speak to somebody there, somebody from home. Mm -hmm. And right on that page before she mentions, um, which I've, I've quoted this before as well, um, but yeah, if I listen, can I hear the voices with the inner ear? Could you hear voices 
I don't know how to pronounce his name, so I'm just going to say Schliemann, in the streets of Troy. If you did, you were crazy too. The Trojans had all been dead 3,000 years. Which is farther from us, farther out of reach, more silent, the dead or the unborn? Those whose bones lie under the thistles and the dirt and the tombstones of the past or those who slip weightless among molecules, dwelling where a century passes in a day, among the fair folk, under the great bell-curved hill of possibility. There's no way to reach that lot by digging. Um, so immediately there's a sense or a relationship with time. Le Guin is, is um, painting here of, of uh, both the inaccessibility of the past and the, and the future and the intimacy in that mystery, in that uh, uh, weighing, you know, how far away the past is compared to the future. The Zen koan that, that sort of um, ends up quieting us and actually allowing us to be somehow a little bit more receptive to those presences, those beings, if only for a slip of the imagination or a creative story or a voice in our minds um, that whispers something, that tells us something. So that and many, many other reasons is why I think we uh, ought to read this book. But um, I linked, uh, I don't think I linked the Amazon page to this, but I, I've got two versions and there are two versions that are available. Um, one is this paperback older edition, uh, which um, I think originally came with, yeah, a, a disc, which you were just listening to when, if you jumped in at the beginning, uh, the music of the Kesh. Um, and then there is a newer edition with some extended bits and pieces here in the, um, gosh, what's this collection? The Library of America collection. And I picked this one up. Yeah, a few of us have that one. Uh, just because there's so many good essays in here. And of course, there's some additional bits and pieces. Um, but of those essays, if you do have that edition, uh, I recommend the carrier bag theory of fiction towards the end of the text. And that's like on page 725. And then there is also an essay I recommended. I didn't realize it was in here, but I've also linked to it in the, in the Patreon uh, post about this. Uh, a non-Euclidean view of California as a cold place to be on page 703. Great companion piece to this uh, to this book as well. And I strongly recommend that. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit today and, and next time as well, just in terms of how to get to utopia without going forward anymore. Uh, what is this that different edition? relationship with time. What is that edition, um, Jeremy? Is that a new or is it a, it's yes. not just always coming home, right? It's something else. Right. It's it's always coming home. Authors expanded edition by the Library of America. Um, okay. And and just to say, those two essays I found PDF versions online. They're probably unsanctioned, but they're out there. Okay. Yes. the the um the non Euclidean essay has found its way into a few uh, journals over the years, and I think it's it's pretty much accessible. Um, just googling it. Um, from a few sources, um, and it's it's really good. It, it's it for me. It was very informative for in terms of thinking about like, well, what is our relationship with time? Do we have a colonial perspectival relationship with time, or are there other modes of time? So Ge uh, Gepser, of course, is is implicitly in this conversation um, in terms of what Le Guin is exploring, um, and then the carrier bag theory of fiction was great. Um, I, I know I quoted it a little bit already, um, but I wanted to bring this in here because it speaks to the novel itself or the book itself that we're going to be reading now. Um, Le Guin writes, uh, one relationship among elements in the novel may well be that of conflict, right, is the typical thing. This is very like, like uh, Jane Allison in talking about this, but the reduction of narrative to conflict is absurd. I have read a how-to write manual that said a story should be seen as a battle and went on about strategies, attacks, victory, conflict, competition, stress, struggle, etc. within the narrative conceived as carrier bag, belly, box, house, medicine bundle, may be seen as necessary elements of the whole, which itself cannot be characterized either as, a conf as conflict or as harmony, since its purpose is neither resolution nor stasis, but continuing process. And I love that as, as the, very formal statement about the structure of this book and very resonant with um, 
again, Jane Allison's text, a meander spiral explode in terms of like how to structure a story with a different kind of narrative, a different relationship with time. Um, so keep all that in mind, right? Um, but let me, before I keep grabbing bits and pieces and fragments, how's everybody doing? Um, is this our first time with Le Guin's writing? I know a number of us joined me for uh, The Lathe of Heaven, so I know we've been revving to do this, but maybe we can just open it up for a few minutes and share a little bit about, you know, why, why do we feel we want to read this novel presently, uh, what has attracted us to it, and, and what, what is already kind of, I don't know, sinking us into Le Guin's writing here. Yeah, Veronica. Hi, everybody. So I need to make a confession. And if you want to throw rotten tomatoes at me, please, you can virtually do that. So after the lathe of heaven, uh, I borrowed the book at the library. And I think I made three attempts and to make a story short, I need a tutor, a mentor, an <laughs> educator. <laughs> and I'm trying to find the reason why I cannot get into it, except for one um, part of, uh, it's a more, it, it's a current story it's towards the end of the book, which is the, uh, not the Library of America edition, the, the older one. Uh, and, and so I, I, I've been sort of uh, doing therapy on myself, trying to find out why this is happening. Um, maybe because I'm reading too many other things. It doesn't matter, but I just need help. That's all I have to say. Maybe it's good that we're all here together. Um, yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've found that um, book clubs certainly are, give you a little bit of uh, oomph and, and, and uh, structure to, to stick to it. And then the conversations might help and, and actually kind of highlight things that you just sort of you don't really connect with on your own or you don't really pick up on it. And it sort of makes the reading experience a bit more enjoyable. So we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Fourth time's a charm, <laughs> Veronica. It's all good. Uh, this traditionally has not been a novel that uh, a book, I even keep calling it novel and it's not a novel. This has traditionally been a book that um, Le Guin fans haven't been able to, to get into. They, they'll read the other ones because they're novels. And then when it comes to this, it's like, I think they wanted the whole thing to be the story that's broken up into different segments. Um, so it's a different experience and I think it's a bit challenging because of that. And then there's so much, it's like, it's this whole fully fleshed out, actualized um, world and, and culture and people. And it's not necessarily an, uh, a stranger entering that world like, like an anthropologist as a character who's kind of going like, hey, this is all new. Like in the Heinish cycle books, there's the, 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 the emissary from the Heinish people, the envoy is, is, is us in that sense. If we go into this world, we don't know anything about these people and we're learning about them. In this, like that, that character is still present, but in a kind of meta textual way, not in the story, right? So it's a, it's a little, it's a little different. It's like um, a reversal. It's, I mean, just like reversal is such a theme in, in the book in, yeah. it, for the cash, like reversal is so it's it's the hinge for them it's the center mm -hmm. and 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 it's sort of like if you look at Le Guin's other like if you look at the Heiner cycle for example like wouldn't it be great to have this for that but we don't oh we gosh. just have the stories right mm -hmm. um but but you want to know everything about those worlds because they're so rich the world's been built with such depth that the stories that we that she wrote actually ride on something that's as it, it feels like it's as deep as this like there's everything there underneath it's not just here's a story that happened on this planet right. <laughs> it's here's an experience as a product of this giant world that she's built everything the language she's built the culture 
and we have the reversal of that with the cash like we have the world building but but the stories happen maybe a long time from now somewhere in california <laughs> 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 it's sort of what it felt like to me um because i want the stories now too but all we really have sort of is stone tellings in mm -hmm. terms of like a traditional narrative but there's some exactly. there's something about what a world builder she is as a writer um uh you know i i was when i finished i i reread some really early stuff um what's the one where they're um where the guy wakes up on the planet. Um, oh, it's like her uh, second novel. City of Illusions. City of Illusions. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh God, I want like to know everything about, you know, I want this for mm -hmm. that story. Um, but you don't have it, you just have the stories. That that's sort of how this this strikes me, Veronica, as 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 all the world building. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Car Carrie's mentioning that too. I'm in a similar place with the book. Keep waiting to resonate with it. Maybe I will. But I haven't yet particularly. I love the Lathe of Heaven, so we'll see the temporal ideas appeal. Yeah, I mean, that could also be the case that that the the exercise of the book itself as this reversal is it might be the most interesting thing for some of us in terms of really getting into the book um, in a different way, like accessing the future. Um, but yeah, yeah, Tra uh, Tracy. Yeah, I was going to say, because I remember trying to read this in high school uh, long ago, and it was like my first Ursula Le Guin after I had read, I think, Stephen R. Donaldson and uh, Tolkien and whatnot. And um, and at the time, I couldn't, uh, I wasn't, I guess I wasn't sort of ready to sort of encounter it. But what I'm realizing, with especially with that int the, the first essay that you were reading from, um, is to me almost like an invitation to be to participate in the uncovering of this so that this what and the what you posted on facebook too maybe that's from the bag the carrier bag theory quote but of where it's a it's something that blooms within me and so this time encountering it i'm participating in that uncovery like i'm the archaeologist here participating with the text and it's become so much more alive um, for me, especially just coincidentally in the last three months, I've read The Dispossessed, Lathe of Heaven, and just finished Left Hand of Darkness. So I'm just like all Ursula all the time now, and it feels um, <laughs> like I'm I'm in, in her world uh, and just uh, eating it up. Um, and I'm really curious, especially now that I've encountered the Pandora uh, little snippet in there and I see that just like stone telling, there's multiple Pandora moments. Um, very curious about how that's going to evolve and unfold. Yeah, there's um, uh, th did you, you mentioned the left hand of darkness, right? Like uh, that's another interesting text that kind of weaves. I mean, there is a there is a story and a through line. It is a novel, but it's interspersed with these little fragments of of myths right. and storytelling, which which is kind of a good blend or best of yeah. both worlds yeah i found that because there was a creation story there was the story of the uh the banished uh you know after his i guess his wife committed suicide like what that experience was for that which wasn't related to the story of Jin Lee and and estraven um but it, yeah it, that to me that was like an ease of introduction into this non-linear way of experiencing it. It reminded me too of uh, Julio Cortazar's Hopscotch, which mm. is in, you. it's encouraged to read it non-linearly, that you can jump from chapter to chapter in any way that you want. And the original publication was as a set of separate chapbooks that you could randomly pick up at different times. Interesting. Very interesting. That's, um, I mean, in, in structure, I know we were talking about Deleuze recently in some of our classes, but um, uh, Deleuze and Guattari's uh, uh, A Thousand Plateaus, it can also be read that way, um, or is it, it's encouraged to be read that way, like a rhizome. You can enter the rhizome in any chapter. Um, and really, anybody who's, who reads and works with books and 
any kind of magical sense knows that any book can be read that way um, in terms of how we practice and, and perform bibliomancy, etc. Um, yeah, any, any kind of initial thoughts from everybody? Um, there's some folks here who I think are new, like Darren, I, I, I don't know if Darren, if you wanted to say hello and just introduce oh, yourself. Totally. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I didn't read, the, I haven't read the book yet. And I only popped in here because I saw the notification that you're live and I have yet to be on a call with in this group. So I just wanted to pop in. Um, I did read Dispossessed uh, about two months ago. And so even though, but I'm just from what I'm picking up on uh, the current book, I mean, the world building and the landscape and, and the mood, I don't know, I'm going to, I'm going to speak in circles. Um, but I just wanted to jump in and just listen in on more Liguin stuff, basically, because I really appreciate uh, her world building and, and the, you know, the people she creates and those universes. So, but Dispossessed was excellent. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know what to say, really, to be honest with you. <laughs> But um, I enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to reading this one too. So, excellent, excellent. Yeah, I mean, uh, oh, all of I those do. are great. Yeah, sorry, we're gonna... the, no, no, no. I was just going to say something. The interesting thing that I picked up on, well, it was towards the end of Dispossessed, um, where, and I can't even remember the main character's name again now because I'm like five books away from it. But he had a friend who created a play. Uh, that was a social commentary on the, the the state of their planet. And Tracy, because you just read it in, within the last few months, you're, this is probably more familiar. Um, but the society basically took this playwright and locked him up to fix his behavioral problems and get him adjusted. Um, and it, it, it very much seemed like, and there was a point at which the, the main character said, okay, we don't really need a central authority here because we're basically all ratting on ourselves. We're all turning ourselves in. Like we're, we're praying like anybody that steps out of line according to their kind of their socialist worldview um, gets the collective turns on them. So there's, there's a weird sense that it, it portends the way almost the left is eating itself now. Um, like you, you can't step out of line, say anything that questions a certain structure or you get canceled. Um, so I just, I thought her take on the kind of utopia gone bad uh, was, was interesting and, and appropriate mm -hmm. or apropos. Yeah, no, this possessed is excellent. I, I mean, I probably would frame it more of. I mean, that's another another book, another frame. But uh, yeah, no, I didn't want to derail anything. Is, but no, 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 that's just good. I mean, I think I think Le Guin's always interested in not in creating dystopias, but um, as as it's called, an ambiguous utopia, right? That pro other social relations are possible, and that failures within that social relationship are going to be illuminating and probable, right? There's no idealistic utopia, right? So um, it's one of my favorite novels as well, The, the Dispossessed. Um, Le Guin's like has got like the top five or so, I think. Um, so no, but that's good. I, I think you, you may very much enjoy this as uh, Le Guin fully Le Guining. Um, and other texts of this very, similar and, and maybe inspired because Le Guin speaks very highly of, of Tolkien, but you know, not the Lord of the Rings proper, but if you do look at the thing, the back of the Lord of the Rings and the fragments of the songs and the whole history, and then you go read the Silmarillion and all the additional texts, it's a similar kind of effect of, of needing more than just the novel itself and working on more than just the novel itself to bring the entire world to life. Um, and with something like uh, this book, Always Coming Home, uh, the language I think is very important in terms of learning this language. I, won't, I don't want to say inventing it because I'm with Le Guin, it's kind of more of listening and, and, and hearing it. And I think Tolkien had a similar experience with, um, with Elvish. Um, really, the, the, the story was a way for him to understand the language and, and what was being said in his context. But it started with these words. 
So perhaps a kind of a similar relationship here too. Um, but yeah, I wanted to also bring up this and just like kind of on the theme for our opening session too. Um, and you're just joining us, Darren, and it's it's good because uh, we don't need to have read anything yet. This is sort of just our thoughts on the book, why we want to read the text now, um, and then some sort of opening notes about the the forward towards the archaeology, towards an archaeology of the future. Um, Le Guin writes, um, I'll just read this, uh, these two paragraphs here, because the, the, the temporal thing is very interesting. I found at last the town I had been hunting for. After digging in several wrong places for over a year and persisting in several blockheaded opinions that it must be walled with one gate, for instance, I was studying yet once more the contours of my, of my map of the region when it dawned as slowly and certainly as the sun itself upon me that the town was there between the creeks under my feet the whole time. And there was never a wall. What on earth did they need a wall for? What I had taken for the gate was the bridge across the meeting of the creeks and the sacred buildings and the dancing place not in the center of town, for the center is the hinge, but over in their own arm of the double spiral, the right arm, of course, there in the pasture below the barn. And so it is, and so it is. And just like as a note is interesting, and I wonder if I, mean, I could see Le Guin kind of walking in the field in California and just like really doing a kind of a place-based thinking and letting an aspect of this place reveal itself. Um, and then as she continues, but I can't go digging there and I hope to find the curved fragment. Uh, I can't go digging there and hope to find the curved fragment of a roof tile, the iridescent foot of a wine goblet, the ceramic cap of a solar battery, or a little coin of the gold of California. The same for gold rusts not that was weighed out in Placerville and spent on or real estate in Frisco, and then perhaps was a wedding ring a while, and then went hidden in a vault deeper than the mine it came from until all security proved ill-founded and now reshaped this time round into a curl-rayed sun and given an honor to a skillful artisan. No, I won't find that. It isn't here. That little sun of gold is not, as they say, dwelling in the houses of the earth. It is in thin air, in the wilderness that lies beyond this day and night, the houses of the sky. My gold is in the shards of the broken pot at the end of the rainbow. Dig there. What will you find? Seeds. Seeds of the wild oats. Just a beautiful kind of temporal weaving of past and present and, and maybe futures, just kind of all constellated together that I just absolutely love as, a, as sort of the opening um, temporal exercise for us. So that all of these things I'm kind of compounding, that the weaving of past, present, and future that she's doing here, the uh, obviously the, the that temporics, then there's a sense of objects themselves as sort of being entangled in their, in their becoming, in their process, the way she writes about the gold being a, a wedding ring for a while, right? The things are processual, which is a recurring theme, of course, in a lot of Le Guin's writing. And then Again, that, that place-based working with uh, what the land reveals to her. Uh, this is something that J.F. Martel bring, uh, brought up uh, in our class yesterday um, on art and contemplation. Um, he's drawing from object-oriented ontology, but this, th this, this aspect of the non-human turn where we're beginning to look at things as um, everything reveals an aspect of itself to us, a face of itself. And he described it as a gift um, for those who were present for the class yesterday. And I, I feel like there's a kind of revelatory process Le Guin seems to be in, in, in a creative flow here with the land, with the place, with the objects in the place, with her imagination as this temporal opening or, or sensory opening. And those, all those things kind of swar swarm and constellate together to create this place that may have been for um, a very long time in the future. So anyway, let me, let me open it up again. And Can I just say, Jeremy, and... I mean, because I was thinking about that same passage. Um, and uh, as just building on what you were commenting about this sort of processual, um, this like temporal fluidity. She says, um, she says that that little, that little son of the coin um, 
And she, I feel like she's going back to, she was looking in the wrong place for her town. Yeah. And she says, it's not, it's not dwelling in the houses of the earth. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's in, it's in thin air. It's in the wilderness that lies beyond this day and night. It's in the houses of the sky and, and the whole sort of myth mythology that, um, of the nine houses that, of the Kesh people, right? Like um, it's, it is divided into sort of the houses of the earth and the houses of the sky and, and the, whoever inhabits the houses of the sky, um, it's a completely different, it's, it's like another, it, 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 I feel like it, the way she talks about the houses in Kesh culture, that's where I feel like the strongest link to some of the transparency between um, sort of structures of consciousness, the way Gebser describes it. Um, and and with, with the houses of the sky, where is it? In my edition, it's on um, page 44. Um, if you're talking about things that happen in the houses of the sky, it includes, um, the sun and the stars, the oceans, wild animals not hunted as game, all animals, plants, and persons considered as the species rather than as an individual, human beings considered as a tribe, people or species, all people and beings in dreams, visions, and stories, most kinds of birds, the dead, and the unborn. That's the houses of the sky, and that's where this little sun is. It's not in the houses of the earth, which is, you know, more sort of phenomenologically contactable. <laughs> you know, it's like the dirt. And um, at the same time, there's all kinds of weird overlap here too, because the moon is in the houses of the earth. And, and, and uh, so, so it really, it's, uh, um, she's building a mythological world that, 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 um, that really integrates this transparency. Uh, like on a on on a really everyday experiential level, and everybody refers to it all the time in this culture. That blows my mind about this book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's on. Uh, by the way, it's forty seven, I think, for for the the common edition. Um, just it's got like a whole a whole chart for us to explore here about the different houses. Um, yeah, no, that's fantastic, and and that is kind of like. I think Le Guin mentioned about this in, in a, the non-Euclidean essay that this is the, the closest she's come to presenting a yin-topia. Um, and let me see if I can actually pull that up here too, because I, I love the way that she writes about it um, in the sense that even more than a dispossessed. Um, let's see if we can get that over here. And it, while I'm looking for that, if anybody else wants to jump in, feel free. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, anyone, but Kelly in particular, uh, as I listened to Jeremy, would uh, I wonder if a audio version of the book would help with the experience for a beginner, at least. I don't even know if it's available, but I'm, I could check. Yeah, I'm not sure if there is. I don't think there's a full audiobook for this. Right. I could be wrong, but but the, the poems, I mean, like the first the first time I encountered this um was 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 somebody speaking some of the poems um in a studio context when we were doing some movement work. And and uh and uh the we had finished sort of an intense period of working together and the person who had been facilitating the movement um as sort of a as sort of a farewell um to all of us recited one of the poems that's in this book um i wonder where it is Let's see if we can find it but mm -hmm. it was um uh, a poem. I forget 
where it is she it was it was the the, the spirit in which she recited this poem was like the, the poem itself is it functions almost as like the giving of a gift um yeah. uh and uh the so she recited this poem and sort of gave it to us at the end of this period of work and the language was so resonant and and in a in kind of a lived context, it, it felt like she was invoking something by saying this poem. And so when you talk about like, if I could, because so much of, so much of the stuff that's shared in the book is, is, is gathered like an archeologist would gather with their tape recorder or their, <laughs> did you know, like that's the spirit in which she, she writes it down. So that's, I think that's an amazing idea, Veronica. I just don't know if anything like that exists, you know, yes. sections of like the poetry or the stories that are meant to be, like she, she writes about them being around the fire or around the, yeah. you know, yeah. that, I think that would be really powerful. I am yeah, not uh, seeing anything. Uh, yeah, Tracy. I was just going to add to what Kelly was saying that brought up this memory that when I went to Naropa, there were, a, there was a group, another group of people that put on one of the plays in, in this as a stage production. And it was beautiful. And at the time, I didn't really know where it was from. I just was was moved by it. But I also wanted to add too about this: the idea of the houses of the sky and the um, the delineations that that she makes in there feels so organic and so sort of juicy to kind of dive into. Whereas I may read Wilbur, and it feels very dry and cut, and like here's where this is and that is, and it's like, okay, well, you've done that. I don't feel like exploring that with you, but with Ursula, I'm like, oh, this, 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 this disrupts my notions of what should be in the houses of the sky. Or, you know, when you include the unborn and the dead together, it's a different kind of thing than to separate past and future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I love I love the list because it seems it's very much like um, that that Gepser quote um, where he's talking about temporix being a most complex nature and then it's just this whole assemblage of different associations, um, but they all kind of as you say there's a sense a sense fullness to them that doesn't we can't necessarily rationally explain, but particularly yes the dead the unborn. And then, as you mentioned earlier, all beings and stories or dreams, um, they're they're in the same place, you know, and that makes sense somehow, um, intuitively even in the sense of like working with ancestors and any kind of magical practice or or tradition. Um, there is this other sense that we are a future ancestor, right? And then we have a relationship with not only the dead, but also the unborn, even in that practice itself, the temporix is all latently entangled in that intuitively, it's, it's what we experience as human beings. Um, so to see it beautifully woven there, as you said, intuitively just woven in there together is, um, yeah, Le Guin, Le Guin was on it in terms of the, the different structures. Um, but yes, I, I forgot what I was gonna mention after this. I couldn't find the quote about yin, yin topia and the dispossessed, but I swear it's somewhere because I remember reading it. So I'll, I'll keep looking at another date. Um, but yeah, and any other opening thoughts or reflections? Um, there's not too much we can talk about without talking about diving in. So, which we can do a little bit, but um, well, and I'm any curious, other? Uh, I'm curious what your Re reflection as to those last two, three sentences in that part towards an archaeology of the future where she says, maybe, you know, bring a baby there less than one year old, and maybe they will hear the song or speak a word. Like, what, what does that say to you about sort of encountering that the innocence and of encountering this possible future? I think uh, there, there's a liminality to the, the image of a child, like bringing a child to a place where the past and the future are, right? Like there, are, it's, it's where time is the most transparent in, in that, you know, succession of generations, right? They're like near, they're at the very beginning of their own 
life cycle, I'm really there in that kind of liminal space. There's this kind of, I mean, poetically, I'm reading this as a kind of translucence that, that the children may be closer in relationship with this form of time, of ancestor time and unborn time than human beings that are older in life are just more readily, you know, that's not as available to us somehow. And again, I think it's just a poetic thing. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but it, in the reading of, of this essay, that's how it kind of spoke to me. Um, the, the intimacy of the young with this different relationship with time or this imaginal relationship with time. Um, I don't know, how did, how did it ring for you, Tracy? Yeah, it's um, it's sort of the. It reminded me of the con of you know, what was your name before you were born, and sort of that in that state of mind of almost as if you're bringing your own child self to that. It may be you're bringing someone else's baby or your baby, but it's really your own uh, portal or way into to being and thinking about that space. And encountering it in a new way, especially when you're encountering something new with someone else, you can kind of see it through their eyes. But specifically, bringing a baby who cannot verbalize what they're experiencing and seeing, there is a there's a transmission of sorts uh, in that co-experience. Yeah, well put. Let's see. Anyone else want to jump in with reflections? Well, we could keep going. Um, but yeah, I mean, where, where, does, where exactly do we keep going besides the stone telling? Um, any, any, um, hmm. I have so many things. Like I have this old note from like five years ago, page 172, um, archaic consciousness I wrote. And let me see if I can find out why. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um interesting well well let's save that actually let's save that um for when can i share one more thing and then i'll stop talking so much no <laughs> oh, share as much as you want kelly <laughs> i just wanted to do this just um for veronica because i know you were saying it's like you're finding it difficult um uh to get into it um so i found because i'm a humongous the Gwyn fan, like I want to be Ursula the Gwyn when I grow up. And so I've read all of her stuff um, and I hadn't read this. Um, uh, and about three years ago was the first time I read it. And I read it because my one of my facilitators gave us this poem at the end of, of, of this period of work. And I found it, it's, um, I think it's in the second section of poetry. Um, and it's the initiation song from the Finder's Lodge what it's called um but it's this it was the sound of the language and to me it seemed so unlike everything else of hers that i'd read or encountered and yet it was very much her um and it it's it's sort of it, it when i that when i then picked up this book um this this poem is a tiny part of it and it didn't read at all like I thought it was going to I mean I was sort of like what is this the same way that that you might be uh, because it doesn't have a you know a, a narrative like our other books but I'll just read it because it's um it sucked me right in from from the houses of the sky um, please bring strange things please come bringing new things let very old things come into your hands. Let what you do not know come into your eyes. Let desert sand harden your feet. Let the arch of your feet be the mountains. Let the paths of your fingertips be your maps and the ways you go be the lines on your palms. Let there be deep snow in your in-breathing and your out-breath be the shining of ice. May your mouth contain the shapes of strange words. May you smell food cooking you have not eaten. May the spring of a foreign river be your navel. 
and may your soul be at home where there are no houses. Walk carefully, well-loved one. Walk mindfully, well-loved one. Walk fearlessly, well-loved one. Return with us, return to us. Be always coming home. Well, thank you, Kelly. I think it's very convincing. <laughs> But also you read very well. Uh, it's, it, it, I was like, oh, I need to read that book, what that was in. So, <laughs> this poem is in which one of the books? It is, it is in, it is in, there's two or three sections of poems. This, this poem is in the fourth section of poems. Okay. So, I, so I, as you go through, there are little, there are little gatherings, mm -hmm. like little sheaves of poems interspersed in the middle. And this, that one, it's uh, the initiation for the Finder's Lodge, which of course, I was like, oh yeah, that's the poem. It's the fourth it's section you said, right? Yeah. So I think that starts on page 387, if you want to read through that. Um, yeah, it is 387 in my book too. Weird. Oh, I don't know what, okay. I don't know what edition this is. It's I, I love that weird. edition. That has some, some great artwork. It does. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think I'll read the that little bit about archaic consciousness. As, as I was reading it, I began to recollect. Um, I just love it, it because, again, um, writing from the sense or perspectives of the future, there's something very powerful about this, not projecting ourselves into the future, but what is future in us coming alive and speaking in the present. There, there is a psychoactive quality there. There's a, there's a slippage of, of the presentism of our culture in being able to do this and being able to imagine something different. But anyway, um, uh, I'll, just, I'll just start here. Uh, let's see. We thank gather and go down the steep street path steps of Wakwaha and past the hinge the springs of the river and into the dancing place. The roofs of the five Hiemas and Wak and Wakwaha are 30 and 40 feet high at the apex of the stepped and ornamented pyramid, the four sided roof that rests upon the five sided underground chamber. On past the dancing place in a grove of magnificent mandrone trees, madrone trees is the long low stuccoed adobe tile roofed library of the madrone lodge of Wakwaha. The archivist, archivist greets us. If you don't have a history, I say to her, how am I to tell your story? Is a ladder the way to climb the mountain? She says, I sulk. Listen, says the archivist. They're always saying that these people very gently, not an order, but an invitation. Listen, you'll find or make what you need if you need it, but consider it, be mindful, be careful. What is history? A great historian of my people said, the study of man in time. There is a silence. You aren't man and you don't live in time, I say bitterly. You live in the dream time. Always, says the archivist of Wakwaha, right through civilization, we have always lived in the dream time. And her voice is not bitter, but full of grief, bitter grief. After a while, she says, tell about the condor. Let stone telling tell her story. That's as near history as we have come in my day and nearer than will come again, I hope. So just beautiful kind of, um, you know, we've been exploring temporics in the Gebser class. And uh, I mean, I, by association, I would say that the closest is like magical consciousness or even mythical. Um, this sort of we've always been in dream time, dream time right through civilization, the way in which these other forms of time are actually kind of holding the little seedling of civilization and history as this little thing that flowers and collapses right and that kind of phallic sense of the mental narrative. Um, it rises and it falls, but there is a dream time holding everything I just I love that like I hope that ending of ending that sentence with I hope that uh, we've returned to this deeper sense of time. Um, but there's so much of this in the book, as, as you heard from Kelly reading and, and this little snippet from the archivist in the um, Wakwaha. So yeah, any, any reflections or stirrings? 
or tangents? That's the passage I have I had read. Oh yeah. Yeah, the archivist. Mm. Yeah, it sounds lovely, Kara says. I think talking about Kelly was reading. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing with Le Guin. It sounds, at the very least, if you can't get into the story, you can certainly appreciate the depth and the poetry. Yeah, I, like, in, Kara, I yeah. love hearing it. I love hearing it a lot more than I like reading it. Um, it's, in a sense, in a way, not my sort of thing. I feel like I have a... I like linear narratives. Linear narratives make sense to me. Um, I, whenever I look at, say, old oral traditions, I feel like they don't resonate with me because that's not my sort of thing. However, um, I don't know. I feel like it has something in there that it's trying to give me. There is something in there. I sense there being something in there. And I feel like it could very simply give me that information. It is a carrier bag of information, but I don't have the hands to take it. <laughs> I don't know how to grow those hands. And it's really frustrating. I think at some point there might be a point where it happens. And I'm like, oh, but it, because it's not the sort of text I'm used to, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> well, maybe just even doing what we're doing here is a way of, I mean, in, in some way, what we're doing is we have this bag of always coming home and we're just reaching in and pulling one thing out and sharing it and then reaching in doing it again. Um, hmm. So maybe that is actually a good way to engage with the book. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I mean, you know, the lathe of heaven worked for me very, very well. And I think yeah. this, it's just, you know, when somebody says, oh, the seven adobe huts of, it's like, well, there aren't any and they're not there and I, I guess with things that are more familiar to me like the lathe of heaven put things in context that are familiar to me so it made sense um even say sci-fi makes sense to me because I'm used to that I'm, I think this is more like fantasy and I don't need fantasy ever but I mean I tried Tolkien and I was just like well this is like the old testament so and so we got so and so in such and such a place none of which exists and i don't know what any of these things mean um i think it's just an unfamiliarity with like the, that way of writing but i feel like there is like yeah there's definitely information in there and i'm looking forward to having that you know this as an intermediary between me and mm. that information um <laughs> it'll be interesting it's almost like being with um I don't know, like every we took out the poem, we, we were looking at that little fragment of the archivist conversation. It's like the, the way you interact with a person or a living being or a place with, with novels, it's like there is that stream of consciousness where the story is unfolding. And the I mean, it's a very complex thing, even being linear, right? There's all of these different threads that are weaving together and character and pacing, et cetera. And with this is like, like hanging out with somebody and maybe th th this person might be very wise and maybe they'll share it with you. But it's like you kind of have to linger with the book in order for the book to reveal something of itself to you. You know what I mean? It's yeah. it's a different, it's not like reading a, a novel. So I get, yeah, I get that sense of... Mm -hmm. I, I don't have that patience. I'm more used to books and novels than I am to people, quite frankly. I think <laughs> with maybe somebody um, who spent more time with people than books, um, this would be a very accessible way into these things. For me, it's anti-accessible. Maybe it'll make me better at people. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it's an interesting experience. There's interest, yeah, that is interesting. I, um, the, the going at it is not as direct. There's like an indirectness or an abstruseness to to it. Um, I was thinking, I'm thinking about this in terms of like how I was doing some yard work this morning. Um, the yard only revealed itself to me when I stopped working and walking around in it and like basically hung out at the side of the house and just waited and listened for five minutes. Mm -hmm. And then the crows started chattering. And then the Blue Jays like jumped down on the fence and started pecking and, and actually using their, their feet to open seeds and like, oh, I never saw this before. Oh, and they were all waiting for me to get out of the way, you know? So there's this kind of weird indirectness 
Hmm. It, it reveals itself indirectly, maybe, is, is a good way to put it. But um, you kind of have to meander and linger. I don't know. <laughs> that's just, I that's just the down. sound. But, like, mm. I do that with landscapes. You know, I'll sit mm. and watch a landscape. Maybe I have to go towards this, like, watching a landscape. Yeah. But, yeah, that's a good way in. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but to, to, to rest assured, we will be reading more Le Guin, so this is not the only. Um, I, I would love for us to read, uh, gosh, I don't even know. I mean, certainly to this possessed, we should just go through Le Guin. I think we'll definitely read um, PKD and also, uh, I just have this like itch to read Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future this summer. So if I've y'all want to come on board I've... with that. That sounds interesting. I'd love mm. to read PKD, of course. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Great. Um, let's see. Cheryl, did you want to jump in too? Yeah. I'm sitting. I'm sitting with such kind of intensity of feeling moved in this session, like just like listening to people like Kelly and yourself and others share. And it's, and it's kind of bringing actually um, kind of a, a very bodily impact of sensing into like, I feel like the, I don't know, it's like the space. Like, I feel like when I read Ursula Le Guin, there's sometimes like this there's often like a longing in me to see the world like she does. And like the irony of that longing sometimes is that I like work at her books too much. Like I, I read her books and it's kind of like I'm reading to get it. And I notice like actually in the session, like I'm, I'm surrendering more to listening to how others are sharing quotes and passages that move them and resonate and just like kind of letting the experience kind of happen to me and how that was that's like the aliveness that I've always been seeking in her writing like and I and I I really liked how Carrie was sharing like because I, I relate to um, the ease with which I can just kind of drop into the flow of a linear narrative. Like I find that in a lot of fiction that I read, um, there's like the books that you, it's like a page turner, you can't stop. You're just kind of carried through almost like actually watching a movie. And then there's uh, books that, yeah, there's like books that actually invite you to participate. And I think that that's what Ursula Le Guin does. Like, I feel like she's, she doesn't just like kind of, she, it's not just like the full stream that she takes you through. It's like, you actually have to, you have to participate it with yourself. Like, I feel like actually I'm, I'm getting the sense of when I read her and like, especially when I'm here, there's like a sense of I'm developing a muscle that I have, like that feels like not used enough and it's like the muscle of the imagination and it's this way of like I don't have to have it be like easy to be carried and involved with the story there's actually ways in which like I become like a co-creator like in very much the ways that she steps into a space and doesn't like that that revealing process of this place that yeah, like, again, I'm sitting with just like how she thinks that there's going to be a wall there and she thinks that there's going to be these types of artifacts and that kind of like forcefulness like suddenly gives way and it's like, oh, you can actually just surrender to like what shows up but there's, and there's also like a dance in which you participate in in order to like meet it. Um, so I'm very struck by, I think right now, like the participation that she, that she really invites you into with through her writing. And also actually that I feel like there's something very alive about really sharing it in community. Like when she 
also talks about like communitas, just like this way in which maybe like her book, this book especially is like meant to be shared in community, like in circle practice of just like picking up pieces and fragments and like weaving it together as a collective. It's almost like the book is is uh, just the beginning of the book, if that makes sense. Like the book is meant to be woven and shared and recited. And that's how it comes to life. Like where is the context we get from it? It's not just in reading front to back. It's like, oh, I love this poem from it. Oh, this is such a great story here. This is such a great fragment. And it's that kind of, like you said, that weaving together that actually is the the performance of the book, the enacting and participating of the book in community is probably the best way to engage with it. I'll bring this up too, because Carrie was mentioning Lord of the Rings. Um, I, like my, my wife and I, uh, we read, I think I've mentioned this before, I've read it out loud to her like a year and a half ago. And um, I had gotten into it on my own, but it took a while. I hadn't really read it as an adult. But really, it was the performing of it and and reciting the tales and the stories and the fragments and talking about the food that the characters were eating and, and getting into the different voices and personas that the book really came to life for me in a very embodied way. So I would say even like a book like like Lord of, Lord of the Rings and Tolkien, it's the same thing. Like, um, performing Treebeard actually was one of the most magical archaic experiences because the way Tolkien and, and and the little caveats that the little descriptions Tolkien had for Treebeard in that in that text um he you could hear him in your head but also the way he wanted you to hear him was very slow like he's a tree he's a tree like so he speaks but his language takes more time to say anything of importance so just like you have to kind of become rooted and baritone and um, rumble words into being. And it was just so fun performing that and playing that. So I just have to say like, yeah, the sharing of the story and the reciting of it and the participating in it for books that are like much more fantastical or of a, you know, a wholly realized culture, I think that can really bring them to life. So I think that's a lesson here. So it's better read together and shared, um, but yeah. Veronica, did you have a, a thought too? Yes, I'm very grateful that um, most of us are now bringing embodiment into it. Because when Jeremy mentioned his yard and then Carrie before that, and then Cheryl, it became more and more embodied. And what, it, what I wanted to say is that it makes me, it's really about the yin and yang. Because um, now the way I look at it, it makes me think of, say, I'm a dancer. And in the ballet practice, I can do anything on the left side, turns, jumps, uh, extension, whatever. And then on the right side, I'm weaker and I'm lazier. It's like it's an effort. You know, if I want to make two turns on the right, I really have to practice more and so on. And so in uh, the, the same thing, like Kerry was mentioning, I can read uh, like the book on Whitehead. I read it in one day. And then I go to always coming home and it's difficult to read one page. And I think this is not healthy. It means the brain is not balanced properly. So that's the medicine. That's the embodiment. Yeah. You know, you've got to take your medicine. I mean, that, I'm, I'm exaggerating because I know it's going to work. And then more things could happen. I mean, there is neuroplasticity, right? At any age. So, mm -hmm. but it is the yin and the yang and we're never really conscious of when one overtakes the other. But now I, I'm discovering it. And I think reading this, well, like as Kelly was saying too, it will really get you to pay attention to the yin and the yang. 
right. in, in, in the language of, of the Kesh and their cosmology, but like they're living and breathing in that complementarity and processual thinking and that kind of a perspectival place-based mythic magical just beauty just like living and participating in that and for you to be able to get into that in a non-novel approach i think it's like there's many there's it's working on you in many different layers um so yes i mean just try it out and in terms of like a like a muscle that hasn't been worked on like yeah i think i think we don't approach reading um like like a almost in a place-based and lingering kind of way when we, 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 we approach reading like okay a good philosophy book a set of ideas that progress and build up together yeah. um i mean even my book with the structures of consciousness takes us all you know in that kind of historical unfolding sense so you know to to not do that very deliberately is um is an exercise um but doing both is fun it's just like i think we've really developed the the forward directed style of reading like I, I've been reading the Expanse books for the past few months. I'm like up to the last one and they're really fun and they're full of action and they're just like pulpy sci-fi, really well written, totally different than Gwen. Yeah. So it's it, like, it's good to exercise your muscles and to try different things. And, but um, yeah, no, nothing against regular books. I think they're, they're beautiful and we should keep yeah. reading them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Kelly, did you want to jump in? Well, I was just wanted to respond really quickly to what Veronica said because it really um, it really resonates with me just in terms of 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 um, practice um, and and the difficulty with when you talk about being it's easy to do everything to the left and then doing it to the right is just harder. It's just not, it's just not developed or it's not your preferred. Uh, um, it's not what you default to. And we have, we have this, um, uh, for me, I think this really, um, well, I work on, a, I also in, I work on this dynamic a lot in the studio, helping people with creative practice. Right. And, and, and I think, in kind of a larger sense, um, like the work of Ian McGilchrist, really, really circles around the same theme that 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 um, we tend to um, have kind of a habituated sort of analytical, relatively high speed, um, sort of information rich way of engaging with the world that is sort of rewarded. Um, by our educational systems and and lots of other things. And so it's also getting stimulated all the time. And that's also, I would say, in my experience as a teacher, that's increased exponentially since we've all gotten these little devices in our hands. So in my 20 years of teaching, like the attention spans of my students have gone like whoosh, in the past 10 years is super dramatic. Um, but But it's not that there is anything inherently like bad about being able to make all your turns to the left and not to the right. It's 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 the it's the it's the huge disparity in calibration and the resistance of doing it in any the risk, resistance towards doing it in any other way where you're like eh, 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 and so you leave it and so I use this muscle metaphor all the time in the studio. It's like we have one arm that's just super butch and really strong. And then we have this other one that's like this, we can't do anything with it. And we need to work. We need to work this other way of being in the world, this other way of knowing, this other way of perceiving, this other time, this other breathing, this other awareness. We need to encounter it over and over again so that we can be also comfortable there. Uh, uh, so we don't skate right over the top of it and, and not even encounter it. Uh, and, and I really feel like this book in particular is completely written in that other modality. Right. It's over there. And so, and so you, can't, you can't sit down and like start on page one and expect to be able to engage with it using that other, that other gear. Yeah, we don't want to be lopsided readers. Mm. 
it's lopsided in general, like lopsided perceivers. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's that, like that line that Le Guin has in, um, in this version of the book, um, that we are so stuck in forward gear that really the healthy thing today would look like a reversal, right? That we are so one-sidedly um, forward moving in our sense of time and culture and everything else that like really we need the reversals. Um, so yes, and then I think that's like very often like in Wilbur's language, like he talks about this pre-trans fallacy. And I do think that is, you know, maybe in, in like, in a hyper mediated sense of romanticizing particular cultures and traditions, but still like very often in a very appropriative colonizing way anyway. So I think we can identify when that's happening. But um, in this other sense, there is something important about reversal, not as a retrograde move, but also as integration. Like if we haven't been using the left hand of darkness, just to use the pun, we ought to actually, and, and allow it to, use itself in its own way. I'm left-handed, so thinking about it also in terms of the hemispheres of the brain. But but yeah, I mean, and, and it will have its own thing. It won't be the same kind of exercises and practices that the right hand might use. Um, so we should do that and practice that. And I think the, pl the plasticity is really what we're looking for. And we can't have that if one side is completely under underutilized and atrophied. So let's move that muscle as, as you're saying and start playing with the left hand of darkness and start um, experiencing yin topias before we shrug off the whole idea of the, the future altogether, which I think um, for the most part, our culture has done in the present in terms of like, we love dystopias, um, but I think we have a very hard time with not utopia per se, because we're so jaded but but imagining an alternative a line of flight it's it's so difficult and so i think this book is really wonderfully illustrating a line of flight something different that looks like a reversal but there's also solar panels and it's kind of a solar punkish novel in that sense too um i would say a little different but still in that in that kind of realm of other possibilities of the future um and yeah that that flexing that muscle of, of temporix which is like you know, to imagine a world which, you know, may have been in Northern California, right, um, might be going to have lived a long, long time from now. So how do, what are those voices saying to us in our present? And how can that help us transform the present by allowing that future to actually have a voice and to speak? I think that's a, that's a muscle that we are very bad at using in our culture. Um, that Gepser seems to be promoting as well as in terms of his writing. So, yeah. Um, Tracy, do you want to jump in? Yeah, just so, I mean, so many, I'm just resonating with so much that everybody has said, but uh, but wanted to add, oh, and I broke my thumb last Thursday and I'm right-handed and I'm having to discover all the things I do with my right hand that now I'm having to do with my left, especially trackpad on my computer which is blowing my mind. Um, but, but the, but the sense of what, what Cheryl had mentioned about, like when you, when you're reading something like, Oh, I want to see the world or experience the world in the way they are. Or when you come across a teacher and you get a sense of, Oh, there's, there's an avenue of exploration and a way of being that I, I, I long for. And that's the, that's the excitement that I get from reading Le Guin and, and, um, it's just, it does, it feels, it's, it's not so much a, a new lens to put on, but it's like, a, it's like a stripping away of a whole way of being in order to see the way she has. And I, and I, think, I think for me being in, so engaged with it, because I've studied a lot of poetry, which has been in that nonlinear form, and a lot of the language poets um, sort of have that way of, of disrupting my experience of, of time. So this is a, this is my injury way into sort of a novelistic way or archaeological way of experiencing uh, a world, which, which then I guess the, 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 the sense that I get then if I go for a walk afterwards and I'm seeing the world differently because of the five pages I just read, that is a, a way of waking up 
something new in me um, that is very exciting. Yeah, in agreement, total agreement. Um, that's that's sort of what I th I'm hoping that as a book club, as an ongoing thing, we can keep practicing together, um, really like exercising those muscles, um, practicing temporics, developing this as a kind of, um, I, I don't want to like use this language too much, but like Latour talks about the, the new subject and he, and he, I mean, this is the theory of like novels altogether and just like fiction writing is like developing a new subjectivity with modernity or et cetera. But like, what about a perspectivity in the integral world and what are the subjectivities and the imaginal constellations our culture is, is, is steeped in? Like we should be reading books like this and practicing with those muscles. Um, so let's keep doing that. <laughs> um, yeah, Darren, did you want to jump into? Actually, at this point, I feel like it's all been covered. So, but I just, I almost just wanted to just like second, third, fourth, fifth, the idea of it all being a muscle that needs to be like consciousness is a muscle that just needs to be exercised. And it's, it's like the daily practices, you know, better habits a little bit of a, at a time, but, but the fact that, and I was thinking about it too, when I did read Dispossessed, um, I did feel engaged on a, a, a much deeper level than say when I read like, uh, I don't know, like three body problem or something like that, which yeah. I, I liked quite a bit and there were great concepts in it. But for some reason, it, it was it was more like a page turner than than uh, like grab you. And that the difference between intellectual learning and emotional learning, like where you get it in your body and you get it in your chest and it really sticks. Um, yeah, just, and, and, and almost like not suffering, but you have to work for it. You know, it doesn't come easy. Nothing, nothing. Yeah. And I've, I've been on this kick with a few friends trying to get them to like exercise consistently and little things to just like get in your body a bit more and, and it helps with so much other stuff. Um, but yeah, like even, even like yoga or, uh, where it's really difficult, where you actually, you don't rest on your laurels or inherent flexibility or something like that or balance, but you have to push yourself consistently and no one else can do it for you. And that's, that's the, I think the interesting thing is like, you can, there's a lot of stuff you can kind of coast by on, but if you actually really truly want to grow, you have to push yourself further than, you know, to a point where, but no one else can do it for you. If that makes sense. I, I'm sorry, I'm not the most concise, but, um, but yeah, but just agreeing with all the notion of exercising the muscles and the, the level that uh, her writings make you work for it. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it's a good lesson to take with us for any, as you're saying, like exercise, meditation, contemplative practice, um, even with, with our work with like Gepser's writings, it's, you're not going to know it. You you just have to like explore it and stick with it and notice the interrelationships of let's say magical structure of consciousness and the mythic and like let it become alive in you and watch those interrelationships occur in you with you in the duration of your day. The only way to do that is to actually be paying attention and be working with it. I mean, it's just, it's a kind of participatory knowing that requires presence, attention, duration, lingering. Um, but then also, like you're saying, the uh, some sense of will of like, I got to show up again and do this again. And so there there's like that. a, mm -hmm. yeah, but there's also like this degree of uncertainty you have to maintain. Because once you start feeling like you actually get it or you know it, you don't. Like you have to stay, I don't know, stay humble, but like you have to stay like, uncertain because it forces your brain to work you know like our brain slips into uh when you have patterns that you've established and habits so your brain doesn't have to work it's like fewer process like way fewer processor cycles but when you actually engage and have to learn the brain consumes four or five times as many calories to do so so your brain as a survival mechanism doesn't want to stay there so, but you have to force it to stay there. You know, like, does that make sense? 
So it's, mm-hmm. it's not comfortable. You have to be, yeah, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think, um, well, yeah, the, Veronica was saying ballet hurts and so does Aikido. As somebody who practiced uh, uh, a few different martial arts, yes, it's, it's, um, I'm kind of weird though. And I, I have to admit that I had like an obsessive period for a few, a few years where I liked that. <laughs> it was very, very into it. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, again, uh, Kelly was saying participatory rather than consumptive. This is not knowledge. You could just download. This is like the only way to know it is to be in it. And then the kind of knowledge you get from it is not really knowledge that is something like you can just go, okay, here's what I learned from being in it. Now you don't have to do it. It's like, it doesn't make as much sense unless you're in it and sharing it, you know, with the other person, maybe a little bit like what we're talking about here with this book in terms of like, the participation is in the sharing itself, but we're all participating that in it. Um, but anyways, yes. Um, and any, any, I know we're coming up towards the, uh, let's see, 90 minute mark. So yeah, Carrie says experience phenomenology seems a way in, or like Carrie was mentioning earlier, like place-based just observation, lingering in a space or lingering in a place and watching things and animals and creatures and daily rhythms just occur in the space is, is you really have to like linger and be present for that, um, for that experiential knowledge. It's the same thing. Um, yeah, ex- experiential knowledge is you can respond with it um, because mm-hmm. it's, it's passed through you. It's embodied. And, and uh, the kind of knowledge that we're sort of, that we default to is the kind that we're probably more used to experiencing, uh, used to sort of encountering in, in a school environment where we have sort of a, a, a set pile of tasks that we have to sort of complete and regurgitate and 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 then it disappears. <laughs> like it's like, uh, uh, um, uh, and, and, and we don't, uh, we think we know it because we've read it. Um, and we don't know it at all because we haven't actually done anything with it or passed it through our experiential mechanisms in any way. And so when it's challenged, we can't back it up. We're just like, whoa, uh, uh, it, usually because it's come from an external source and sort of hit us. And we're like, I know that I can speak that out. But 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 it hasn't it hasn't come from within us and gone out like the direction is is why the reversal is so profound. Uh, if you've experienced something then uh, um, you have a more intimate understanding of it and that's dimensional, that's spatial. And, and when it's challenged, you, ha- you have a response that is more rooted because uh, uh, it's, it's, it's been embodied. Indeed. Did yeah. that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it makes sense to me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Even, um, even philosophy though, I found like, I, I do have that fun um, experience of like reading difficult philosophical texts. I mean, obviously with Gebser, but like even more just traditional philosophy um, books and being able to, but it's it's like a that itself is a muscle. Like I actually feel better thinking of it as like a, like a brain muscle that I'm working on to really like get what Deleuze is talking about and to learn that language. And there, there's a, this is something Adam Robert talks about with philosophy as a skesis, um, this sort of um, stretching and willpower and, 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 and building up capacities to think and thinking as a sort of transformative. I think if we think of thinking in that way <laughs> as an experiential thing, practice that we actually have to embody thinking remains closer to these other modes of knowing and in a better relationship with them um so so i always say like if we're going to be very heady like we really need to frame being heady as this um like a martial arts practice or a dance practice or anything it's like you're stretching your brain it might be good to be doing other material exercises as embodied exercises as you're learning um, so bringing them together, I think, is mm. is helpful. The whole thing of being open and letting go at the same time, in like the open, we strive and seek boost the openness, but we can't grasp it. Once we grasp it, the whole thing comes apart. 
So it's like there's so many balances in life. <laughs> you you find keep finding more words to describe them. <laughs> Endless words. <laughs> Endless words to describe. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. It's it's a miracle what happens in these. These can't, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank, thank, you. thank you, Betty. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of like almost the word, the hinge and just like the wording is actually like, there's no end to it. It's just this spinning and spinning of worlds and language yeah. and practices and myths um, and my cat meowing. <laughs> <laughs> but I know we're coming up at the 90 minutes. I don't want to go too much over at the at the beginning here. We haven't really dived into the the substance of the book, although I feel we have really, I mean, oh, very yeah. much so. Very much. Um, <laughs> I have one very quick question, very, very easy to answer. Uh, besides Always Coming Home, which other book would you recommend? Either The Dispossessed or City of Illusions, or what else would you suggest? Uh, um, okay, I I think the Lathe of Heaven would probably be my yeah, first go to. Yeah, and after that, um, yeah, the Dispossessed probably. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and then and then the the other, the Heinish books, they're all good. The tell I think what's it called the Telling, it's sort of a later one, well, that's very good. Um, I kind of wish. I mean, I, I wish Le Guin wrote more the Heinish books. There's just so much to explore, but I know there's the Earthsea as well. Um, and I haven't actually done Earthsea at all. Um, maybe with like <laughs> Carrie's bias is also my bias. Like I just love science fiction and it took a long time for me to get a, a to warm up to Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings, but I need to read. Maybe that'll be one of the book clubs we do too sometime this you year. You should so. totally read Earthsea. You Earth should read sea. the new ones too, because of course she hammered out like the first three um, in the early seventies, one right after the other. But then yeah. she wrote a fourth and then she wrote some short stories and then she wrote The Other Wind, which is, which sort of is on the very end of, uh, it's like, it's really like five books, not three uh, plus short stories and those, those later ones added to the first really are choice. Mm, mm. Really, really and good. I'd, I'd say as a bundle of medicine, both the dispossessed <laughs> and Earthsea, even just the, the first three, they they are medicine if you give okay. yourself over to that story. It, it, yeah, I can't say enough about it. I would back that up 100%. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Gordon White of Rune Soup convinced me uh, already about Earthsea. I just haven't loaded it up. I haven't done my due diligence. Um, we had a good chat about it. I, I don't remember if it was on his podcast or mine uh, last year, but but he convinced me. And uh, this is just like, yeah, of course, yes, medicine. I know it is. I don't know if I'm re I'll, I'm ready for the medicine, but like in terms of the timing, we'll see when we can squeeze it in. Um, Okay, just a few notes. Um, I don't know. Let me check my schedule too, and uh, because we'll, we'll probably do another Tuesday. Um, in two, in, what do you think? Two weeks or so? Like, um, is that good? And let me double check because that may be a day I'm flying into New York uh, to visit my family. I'll, I'll double check, but yeah, let's tentatively two weeks from now on the next Tuesday. Um, for this first section. And I think that's through, uh, let's see, on in this book, in the in the collected, the new collection, uh, that is stopping at the second part of a uh, stone telling story. So the next section is dramatic works. So like, I don't know, that's like a good third. Um, so we'll read up to that. I don't know what page that's on on the other versions of the book. And then uh, we'll go from there and see if uh, three we can fit it all in, in three sessions. Um, 
and then also there's a few few other notes uh tomorrow there's going to be an office hours mutations but it's going to be a special yep. extended version of the uh the workshop i hosted at iec for folks who couldn't participate in our iec um it may be a lot of stuff you're already familiar with 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 gepser um but i'm hoping to really um focus on the second part of the presentation which i didn't really have enough time to squeeze in in its fullness uh, which is more about reclaiming time, little micro manifesto, exploring that. It's 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 much more science fiction oriented, I suppose. So, um, join me for that tomorrow, same time, two p.m. Um, but then also, uh, Eric wanted me to come onto Clubhouse, so I'm like doing a weird, like informal version of that at twelve. So if you are on Clubhouse and you want to hear a shorter version and just participate in that community, I'll be giving like a fifteen minute opening to the clubhouse session on uh, integral leadership. Um, if not, just join me tomorrow, uh, Wednesday at 2 p.m. We're going to talk about fragments of an integral futurism. It should be a lot of fun. And uh, I mean, yeah, that, that'll everybody. be recorded. Will that be recorded as, as usual tomorrow? Like, yes. In case I, yes. Have this, I have some crazy conflicts this week. No problem. Yeah. Hopefully I could be there. Yeah. And I think some IEC folks are also going to be joining in um, because what I love doing at the, at the integral conferences is introducing Gepser and Temporix and then Everyone going, huh, oh, this is interesting. I never heard of that before. And then bring them in. So I think I've brought in a few new folks. So um should be fun. All right. Thanks, everybody. This was a great opening session. Um, I will see you again in, for the next one. Take care. Bye. Ciao. Bye, everybody.